sensations. Try their new Mediterranean bowls with grilled shrimp or salmon. And what I'm finding is that the 6GM6, 6 6BZ6 6 is uh, outperforming the 6AK5. It's more stable, gives more output. It's a much happier tube. So I don't use the term magic or magic circuit very often. But when it comes to the super regenerative detector, um, we've got something fairly special. Uh, there's a lot on the, uh, on the internet and there's a lot all over the literature on this. And uh, very little information is transmitted. It's uh, very hard to explain something when you don't understand how it works. And there are three things happening at once in this circuit. It's very difficult to describe what's happening in a circuit uh, that's so simple, yet is doing so many things at once. Uh, this is part two of the Super Regen series, and I think you're going to be really interested in what we're going to do with one tube. This first circuit is a classic, and it is seen in its various forms all over the literature and in practical receivers and early transceivers, like the one for 5 meters in the 1930s. The strange connection of the tuned circuit between the plate and grid is an often misunderstood oscillator called the Armstrong or DeForest Ultra Audion. Sometimes it's called a Colpitts Audion, a Heising, Cockaday, Marnike circuit, and even sometimes the Super Widget oscillator. On appearance, it feeds back to the grid through the tuning circuit and the grid re resistor capacitor combo. This seems like a very direct route for feedback and regeneration. Remember that there must be a 180 degree phase reversal for feedback from plate to grid, because the tube of course inverts. Actually, the feedback is done in a conventional way. You just can't see it. The internal capacitances of the valve do the trick. This is really a coal pits oscillator. These internal capacitances are usually never shown in any diagrams, and thus the circuit looks very simple compared to most oscillators. But if we redraw the circuit with them shown, it's easier to see that this is in fact just a coal pits oscillator. And uh, C2 is the grid to cathode capacity of the tube, and C3 is the plate to cathode capacity of the tube. So when you look at those two capacitors, we have a capacitive voltage divider network just like the original coal pit. So rather than being a brand new type of oscillator, the Ultra Audion is actually a coal pits oscillator. And uh, with these three diagrams, we can see an original coal pits with the capacitive feedback. And uh, we can see the second one, which is the Ultra Audion oscillator without the extra capacitors drawn. And then the third diagram shows these invisible capacitors in the circuit. There is a little complication, however. Notice the center tap. Now this messes it up because that changes the topology to a classic UHF Hartley. So we're blurring the lines between Ultra Audion and Hartley Oscillator, the way this is drawn. So you can see how a split stator at this point for C1 would be superior because uh, you could make the, uh, the rotor grounded and now hand capacity would not affect uh, the tuned circuit like it would uh, in the circuit shown. And sure enough, the first one that I built, the hand capacity was a real problem. You have to use a shaft uh, isolator in order to uh, get away from that if you're using a very simple capacitor like that 35 uh, puff that we were using. So what about the quenching, the, the self-quenching circuit? If we consider that the tune circuit and the radio frequency choke are both short circuits at ultrasonic frequencies, now we can see that this is nothing more than a temptation for what we call motor boating. And uh, this motor boating effect, uh, killing the oscillations at some high rate, uh, it's affected uh, greatly by the tube and the bias, uh, but uh, you can see that uh, we could call this squagging 
squagging is where you're turning an oscillator on and off rapidly and uh, the, the quench frequency is basically set up uh, with the with the grid leak, grid leak circuit and the uh, C2 bypass and, and that uh, determines uh, uh, what's going to happen as far as the ultrasonic frequency. Uh, what else? Let's take a look at uh, the, uh, the second circuit. Right off the bat, this one looks more conventional. You can't see it, but it, there's, it's really a coal pits oscillator here made of the tube and socket capacitances between the control grid, cathode, and ground. This handles the RF oscillator. Uh, see that grounded tank? That's really nice because that eliminates the hand capacity issue uh, pretty much altogether if you put the rotor, uh, the grounded rotor uh, configuration on C1. Also, do you notice that uh, both of these either use a choke or an output transformer? That's going to give the most recovered audio. Remember, uh, these are basically very simple grid leak detectors. So the audio is, uh, is a grid leak detector setup. And uh, uh, buried in all of this mess, we have several things happening at once. Uh, we have the, uh, the RF frequency, we have the quench frequency oscillation, and we need to separate the audio from both of those. And that's what the, uh, the low-pass filter is all about with uh, C2 and C3 and RFC2. So before I get into a long-winded discussion on exactly how a super-regenerative receiver works, let's consider this picture. So I ask you, what is this? Most people would say this is a regen receiver. But the real answer is, I don't know. It could be a regen, or it could be a super regen. The difference between the two is simply how much feedback is available from the tickler coil back to the primary. If we overdo the feedback, and some of you have already seen this with your regens, suddenly the regen goes completely crazy. Guess what? That's super regeneration. So think of a super regenerative receiver as just a regenerative receiver that's got a massive amount of extra feedback. So it turns out that the ultra audion oscillator and its topology is a feedback system that has so much feedback that it's almost impossible to stop it from oscillating. And that's why this is used for the super regenerative receiver rather than the conventional regen with the tickler coil. Both are viable. But how does it really work? What is this super regenerator? First let's consider a, re a regenerative receiver. The output of the receiver has positive feedback applied. Some of that output is fed back in phase. This is our simple regen. Any signal present at that time will be amplified repeatedly and this can produce signal amp levels of a thousand times or more. We know we can get great amplification with the regen. It's possible to, to achieve gain levels approaching infinity by using positive feedback techniques like this with the circuit on the point of oscillation. In reality, infinite gain is not possible because of issues like losses, phase shifts, stray capacitances, and so on. Oscillations initially build up from noise within the tune circuit. The grid is driven into the positive region during the peak of oscillation. The grid leak, R, for us R1, in discharging C, in our case C2, is great enough that the tube is basically cut off for a greater portion of each oscillation cycle, up to the point that it cannot overcome the circuit losses during the rest of the cycle. After building up exponentially from noise to the level where the grid current flows during the peak of oscillation, the oscillation then begins to decay rather gradually until the instantaneous grid bias is above cutoff for the tube. At this point, the oscillations decay exponentially. The value of C must be large enough so that the time constant, RC, is sufficient to prevent the bias voltage from decreasing appreciably before the oscillations decay to the point where the tube no longer conducts at all. R and C are made large enough to induce intermittent oscillation, and the, 
the exact value of RC is therefore determined by the desired quench frequency. The super regenerative detector detects the presence of a carrier and modulation by sampling. Hey, that sounds kind of digital, doesn't it? The signal at the quench frequency rate is what we're sampling. Obviously, this is done at the Nyquist rate or higher. So let's say we're doing a 300 hertz to 10 kilohertz audio waveform. The quench frequency must be at least 20 kilohertz or twice the highest frequency you want to demodulate. Valve demodulation can be by grid leak, which is a nonlinear process, or plate detection, which is a linear high level process. And this depends on the conditions and bias of the regenerative detector. Essentially, the super regenerative detector is similar to the ordinary regenerative type, but with a low but ultrasonic signal in introduced in such a way as to vary the detector's operating point at a uniform rate. As a consequence, the introduction of this quench or interrupt frequency, the detector can oscillate at the signal frequency only when the operating point is in the region suitable to produce oscillations. Because the oscillations are constantly being interrupted, the signal can build up to a relative tremendous proportion, and the super regenerative detector is extremely sensitive, possibly the most sensitive single stage detector known. When it says to use an RF choke value that is suitable for the frequency, what does that mean? What is suitable? What they're trying to say is it's one that has enough reactance in the band that you're using. So, uh, for instance, how much is enough? Remember our old 2 pi FL inductive reactance formula? Generally for oscillators, you really need 300 to 1,000 ohms to block RF. A 6 microhenry choke gives around 350 ohms in the FM band, and a 22 microhenry choke gives about 1500 ohms. So that's why I said uh, a choke between maybe 6 and 22 microhenries. You can go higher than this, of course, and get even more blockage. So a choke of uh, 50 microhenries, for instance, would work just as well in the FM band. And uh, I've just got a selection of chokes here. Some of them are uh, Manufactured chokes, a couple of them are something that I wound up. Over here we have a typical choke that's wound on a non-ferrous core. It's just a composite, and that's running around 6 microhenries. That probably would be an excellent choke for, say, a 2 meter or maybe a 220 megahertz type super regenerative. Next I've got some number 24 wire. Uh, wound on a two inch wooden dowel, which is equivalent to a big pen form that I talked about, and that's about uh, 12 microhenries. That probably would work for us. Um, my target choke is made with number 28 wire on a two inch piece of, uh, of dowel that's a little thicker than a quarter inch, I think it's 5 sixteenths, and that's just about exactly 20 to 21 microhenries, which is perfect for our range in the FM. Then I've got a, a, a store-bought choke that's around 120 microhenries, a 680 microhenry choke, and finally a 1 millihenry choke.
So this is a 6AU6A. It wants to work, but uh, I think the inner, inner electrode capacitance is just too high on this tube to work in this particular circuit. So it does work, but uh, it actually works better with the 6BZ6 than the uh, 6AK5. With a potentiometer that I put on this, which the original doesn't have. I've also got a low-pass filter, which the original does not have. So I'm putting a lot of band-aids on this circuit to make it work. Isn't it acceptable to go to McDonald's just for a drink? Why, yes. Yes, it is. It's more than it. Documents unsealed today reveal a federal grand jury indicted to tell J. Alexander. The circuit is pretty squirrely. I mean, it is working after a fashion, but I'm not particularly impressed with this circuit. And uh, is it an FM receiver? Yes, it's working, but uh, it's a little tough and it tunes fast and uh, it's quite unstable. And that's with that in the potentiometer, by the way. So this is the 6AK5. The audio output, of course, is much lower because the 6AK5 is a higher gain tube and uh, it uh, is running at about 36 volts, whereas the 6BZ6 wants to see closer to 70 volts and, of course, it puts out a lot more audio. So I'm being fooled a little bit by audio volume. Uh, the 6AK5 does It does pick up stations, but but I don't find this as pleasant as I do using. So the 6BZ6, of course, it's more output, you're running a little more voltage on the plate. So you can get here on the plate. Yeah, it's about 76 volts. So it's more of a radio, but uh, still not super impressed with this circuit. It's a time of intimacy between two people who enjoy being with each other, but erectile dysfunction ruins sex often making what should be a very special time frustrating and embarrassing for both you and your partner. I had a great time on, on Wall Street, but it didn't satisfy my soul. And I've always loved educational institutions. Uh, my father was a university professor. My grandfather was a university professor. Swenson, too, taught a class at Yale. Yeah, he did a thing. That's like a... <laughs> 
more like a very likable high school math teacher. But pretty soon, he was revolutionizing the way universities invest their money. Instead of just buying a simple mix of stocks and bonds, the flash center was also real estate. Facilities in New Hampshire have the green light to begin loosening some restrictions. So this is the second circuit, and I'm actually using the pentode like a pentode. So we're adjusting the screen on this particular circuit. And uh, it favors the, uh, the pentode probably up to about 130 megahertz. After that, you can start to use the, uh, the UHF triodes like the 6C4 and uh, some of the, the small TV triodes like the 6BZ7 and so on. Um, the pentode is a lot easier to control. It has uh, very good selectivity. You can really see the uh, slope detection on the FM with the, uh, with the pentode. And uh, I was able to use this circuit which has a grounded stator on the uh, uh, grounded tank and uh, that means that you don't have the problem with hand capacity changing the frequency like we did with that other circuit where the variable capacitor is floating and both sides of the capacitor and the tuned circuit are hot so it t tends to uh, be very susceptible to hand uh, capacity whereas this one having a grounded tank uh, the uh, the rotor is actually grounded, and that's the part that you're turning, and uh, so your hand capacity has almost no effect whatsoever with this pentode circuit. I did notice uh, when I put this new variable capacitor on that only has two plates that I was not able to cover the entire FM band. So I would say maybe three plates is appropriate to cover the whole band. But it gives me, uh, you know, some good band spread at least. So let's uh, turn this up and see what we can uh, hear. So, I think this is a much better circuit. It's very forgiving for different types of tubes. The only difference is you have to change the number of turns or squeeze the turns depending on the inner electrode capacitance on the tube. But uh, everything from the original 6AK5 to 6BZ6, uh, 6CB6, uh, which are very popular TV tubes, work beautifully in this circuit. I was not able to get low frequency uh, pentodes such as the. Uh, 6BA6 and the 6AU6 to work in this circuit probably would work fine down on 6 meters around 50 megahertz but uh, the capacitance is so high in the tube I was going to have to fool with it to uh, try to make them work but the 6CB6 and the 6BZ6 6GM6 work beautifully in this circuit satisfied I had a better mm -hmm. It is a fantastic program. It's very eye-opening, and it gives you a lot of a lot of choices for food. Your GMC Plus now and will include a bottle of new Nugenix Thermo, our most powerful fat incinerator ever. So this is the uh, second circuit, the pentode uh, using the screen grid control on the super regenerator. By the magic of radio, we're going to take you right up to Jimmy in one of America's great cities. This circuit is preferred up to about 130 or 140 megahertz. After that frequency, uh, triodes uh, really start to show 
advantages, but uh, 6 meters, 10 meters, low frequency, and certainly uh, here in the FM band, this uh, conventional uh, Pento super generator is uh, superior. So finally, and most importantly for you guys that are actually going to build this radio, uh, do not emulate my build style, which uh, mounted the socket on the uh, front panel with the tube sticking out. Even though it looks okay and allowed us to see what was going on very easily, it was very difficult to do uh, construction and changes with that tube socket scrunched up against the front panel. It would be much better to use an ordinary metal project box like a chassis, an aluminum chassis, uh, where the tube is uh, tube socket is mounted normally and when you look in the box you see the bottom of the tube socket, you see the back of the tuning capacitor and everything's much easier to wire. So we took a look at the two most popular forms of the Super Regen and uh, got some excellent results on the FM band by using slope demodulation. Um, in part three we're going to attempt a little bit higher frequency and we're going to look at what happens if we have uh, AM signals for uh, perhaps in the aircraft band. Uh, stand by for part three.